Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, admissions debrief. So there's a few people I'd like to introduce before we start. Um, Nicole, why don't you go first and introduce yourself to everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Gazzola. I am currently the admission counselor for the DBM program. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and um, so who's here from the Future Vets Club? Are uh, the co-presidents here? The Future Vets Club at the University of Guelph is a great resource for anyone who's at the university and um, a great uh, resource for you to join. They have lots of fun activities. They're going to have some virtual events. Um, great, so Tula, are you here? She was here. I think she's off. Uh, I can introduce them later because I do talk about them later. So let's uh, let's go to the PowerPoint. Oops. Okay. There we go. Does everyone see that? Can I get a yes from somebody? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, tonight we're going to be doing a debrief of uh, admissions in general and uh, the last cycle in particular. Um, so what you should know about the goal of the admissions process is that it's it's meant to choose candidates who will successfully successfully achieve the DVM curriculum competencies and as a result serve society's needs and uh, everyone should be well aware of this website. This is the website that uh, has all the information about um, uh, the the admission cycles, the statistics for the last, oh, I think 13 years now. I'm going to put up the one for the last year uh, shortly. And it also has um, a lot of uh, information about uh, courses. And there's a lot of information that you need to know about courses and the requirements and um, the academic and the non academic stuff. We'll do a little bit of that today. Um, so uh, if uh, everyone could turn off their microphone right now, uh, we will talk about the Future Vets Club later. And Kula and uh, Noam, if you're here, I'll give you a chance to um, chat with everybody. But um, everyone, please turn off your microphone. Okay. So let's talk about how we select uh, the people in the program. Um, the class, uh, each class is made up of 120 students right now. We have 105 seats that are reserved for Canadians and 100 of them are from undergraduate programs, which I think the majority of you are today. Um, and today uh, this talk is really going to focus on the undergraduate pool. So that means that um, you're applying with the marks that you got from your undergraduate program as and the, with all the experience and letters of reference and stuff like that. We also have five seats, uh, up to five seats for people uh, in what we call the graduate cohort. And those are um, for people who have done a master's or a PhD um, and want to apply uh, with not only their marks from their undergraduate career, but also their marks from um, their graduate program. And productivity for that is very important. Productivity being um, number of first authored papers, second author, um, places where you've, uh, or a number of times that you've presented your results at conferences, things like that. So that's a separate cohort. Uh, you can have a graduate degree and still uh, apply as an undergrad. If you did well in your undergrad, it's really up to you how you would like to apply and how you feel you would um, sell yourself best and you'd have the strongest application. Um, and the other thing you should know is that you can apply any time after you've done your undergraduate degree. You don't need to apply while you're in it or just after it. You can go out and work and gain experience, uh, uh, travel or whatever, but you can apply after uh, you've done your undergraduate degree and your marks will not uh, expire. Okay, and then we have 15 seats for international students. So these are students that do not have Canadian uh, citizenship or permanent residency. Um, and it is also uh, not for students that have a dual Canadian citizenship because uh, that would make you Canadian. Um, so that's really for people who have um, nationality outside of Canada. Um, and um, they apply very similarly to the uh, 
undergrad, but uh, they apply through a separate system. Okay, so these are currently the uh, requirements for the VET program. Um, I'm just, I just have a couple of rules on here, but there are many more. Um, so you need to do at least two years or four semesters full-time. So by our, def our definition, full-time is five courses per semester. And that can include a summer semester, but again, if you do courses and you want them to count as uh, um, prerequisites for the program, your summer semester has to have five courses as well within those months that are considered the summer semester. Um, and these are the eight courses that you need to have, so two biological sciences. And we do have a list of uh, courses that you can use if you're at the University of Guelph in each category. And if you're not going to the University of Guelph, you might still want to look at that list just to see the kind of um, courses that uh, fit under that definition. So biological sciences is actually a very big category. It can include anything from um, anatomy, physiology, uh, so many different things. Um, and again, that list will help you kind of look at what people can use in Guelph as a biological science. So if you're um, at another university, you might have taken a course like that um, and you can use it as a biological science. Then there's uh, cell biology, genetics, biochemistry, statistics, and two, humanities, social science, which is also quite a big category. Um, it can include languages. Um, really, um, what we like to see is uh, courses that help you learn how to uh, interact with people or learn how people tick. So psychology is a great idea. Um, ethics is a great idea things like that. So um, philosophy, those are all good choices. Um, and uh, generally, uh, you should know that um, all requirements have to be completed by December 31st, before the year you want to enter the program. Um, so uh, for the next cycle, if you're going to going to be applying um, for fall 21 entry. That means that you have to finish all your academic requirements by the end of the semester, so fall 20. Um, and the main reason for that is because when we do our calculations, which I'll talk about later, um, we need to have a final mark for everything for March 1st. And if you're in a a course right now, um, I mean, sorry, if you're in a course uh, in the winter semester, we wouldn't be able to get a final mark in time to apply it to your admissions average, so then uh, you wouldn't be able to use that. So um, normally, the last two full-time semesters would be uh, the semester you're in right now, so fall 20 for 21 entry, um, and uh, the last full-time semester before that. Normally, if you didn't do a full-time summer semester, it would be your winter semester 20 as well. Um, and if uh, you are not going to the University of Guelph, it's always a good idea to get your courses approved ahead of time. Um, we also suggest that you get them approved for content even before you take the course, just to make sure that you're taking a course that we will accept as a prerequisite. Okay, and there's a lot of other rules around um, courses, so please read over our website. Um, so, um, what we do is we take the average of the eight required courses uh, and you get to choose which courses you put forward as your eight. So that means that um, you can uh, select the ones, say you have five different biology courses under your belt. You can choose the two with the highest marks, which is what people are doing. And that's fair in that I think people understand that. Um, so that's the best practice. Um, and then uh, we also take the average of your last two full-time semesters. And uh, both of those, you have to have a minimum mark of 75%. However, um, if those averages are around 75%, um, then you might want to take a look at the statistics we have for the last um, few um, application cycles and decide if you'd be a competitive applicant because the averages are um, higher than that. So 
even though you could apply, uh, you may not get an interview with averages close to 75%. Um, and then uh, after the interview, this mix of uh, eight courses and last two full-time semesters become 65% of the final grade uh, that we look at before we make our offers of admission. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have to, I'm not sure how to get back to the, oh, here it is. Okay, so the, if you have a question, please put that in the chat, um, just related to what we've just talked about. Um, Keep in mind, I do not do course approvals. That would be Nicole, and this is not the forum for that right now. Um, if you want to do a course approval, then you would have to go through the formal process uh, if you're not at University of Guelph. Um, okay, so Emma asks, is the application process any different if you're applying as a Canadian citizen from a US university? No. So there's two separate uh, ways to apply. One is uh, on the Ontario University Application Center, which is, they're both online, uh, what I'm going to say, but um, what we call UAC, uh, is uh, it opens in, Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, does it, it opens in late September, I think? Yes, or beginning okay. of October? Yeah, okay, so late September. So you, there is a section there that you would uh, go into, um, and uh, you'd fill it in. Keep in mind that you have to be an Ontario resident to apply to our program. Um, so all of the schools in Canada have a residency requirement. Uh, so uh, you must qualify as an Ontario resident um, while, uh, if you want to apply here. Um, other provinces are covered by other vet schools, so um, that's something uh, that you need to look at if you're not a resident of Ontario, okay? All right, let me scroll up and see the other questions. Uh, when will the stats for OVC admissions for class of 24 be posted? Probably this week. Uh, haven't gotten to it yet, been a bit busy with other stuff. Uh, what was the cutoff average in the last application cycle? Um, you're going to see that uh, after when I go over the stats. For categories that require two courses, can you apply with one full year course? Nicole, I'll let you answer that. Yes, you can. Perfect. Uh, Giselle, would you mind turning off your camera? Thank you. Uh, okay, so Chris, Christian asks, can you briefly discuss how the pass-fail options from winter 2020 will work this cycle? Would you like to handle that, Nicole, since you've been handling a lot of these questions? Uh, sure. So I'm just going to refer to the posting that's on the OVC website, and I would encourage you all to get familiar with that one. <laughs> so I'm just going to read through the points. So courses with a final grade of pass cannot be presented as prerequisites and must be from an acceptable full time. So minimum 2.5 credit or 15 credit hour semester. Um, so it, courses that are presented as prerequisites must have a numerical or alpha grade. Winter 2020 will be considered a full-time semester so long as it contains a minimum of 2.5 credits or 15 credits hours and has a numerical or alpha grade in a minimum of 1.5 credits or 9 credit hours. So you can have pass grades in a maximum of 1.0 credits or 6 credit hours. That would be acceptable. And then winter 2020 will be considered one of the last two full-time semesters so long as it is a full-time, so again, a minimum 2.5 or 15 credit hours acceptable semester and has a numerical or alpha grades in a minimum of 1.5 credits or 9 credit hours. So again, a pass grade in a maximum of 1.0 credit or 6 credit hours will be acceptable. Any courses presented as a pass grade will be excluded from the calculation of the cumulative average admission average. Any past course credits completed as part of a graduate program from the winter 2020 semester will be excluded from the cum cumulative graduate program admission average. So that was a lot of information that you can read for yourselves on the OVC site. There's a nice big red banner right there. <laughs> okay, did that help, Christian? Yep, thank you. Awesome. Okay, Escrava. Um, I'm a dual citizen and live outside of Canada, so I do not need to be an Ontario resident 
for 12 months to apply? I think that, you mean, do I need to? And the answer is yes. So you, there's only two categories. Either you're Canadian and you have Ontario residency or you're not Canadian. So um, unfortunately, uh, there are some people that do fit in that category that they grew up outside of Canada. So if you want to come to our school and pay the Canadian tuition, which is pretty fabulous compared to the other schools in the US, um, you do need to establish residency of uh, 12 months before you apply. Uh, so uh, you'd have to move here. Um, might be a good idea to get some uh, Ontario related veterinary experience and volunteer while you're here, but you do have to get those 12 months done uh, before the application. Okay. Um, when filling out a course approval form, is it for the last two full-time semesters? I'm not sure I understand your uh, question, Serena. Do you want to turn on your microphone and your camera and ask that, to clarify what you're asking? Hi. Hey, Serena. Hi. Um, so I guess my question is when you're applying or when you're sending the um, course um, what's it called? The course approval request. Yeah, yeah the approval. Um, would we state the courses that we took in our first full time semester and our second full time semester? So, for example, like winter 2020, fall 2020. You can send it in for any semester. Um, I usually uh, like if you know that you want to take a course as and use it as a prerequisite and you're not going to University of Guelph, I usually suggest that you send it in for content first before you okay. even take it to make sure it's acceptable but right. there's no, no limit to like it's too old you can't get it approved uh yeah you could do it for any semester okay thank you yeah and i didn't talk about appeals thanks it's okay um you um uh, for those of you uh who uh have to work full time um and it's a like a career change option or you have a reason um like a medical reason or um an accommodation that uh, that uh, you are uh, told not to take full-time studies that you have to take for semesters or less a semester uh you can um Send in, you can apply for an appeal, uh, and that process is summarized on our website. And uh, I do suggest that you do that because we don't want that to mean that you can't become a veterinarian um, or study at our school. We do uh, want a lot of diversity in our program, people from all kinds of abilities and backgrounds. So if there's a reason why you can't take um, uh, the program, your program full time in undergrad, uh, think about submitting an appeal. Um, for any um, semesters that uh, you have a prerequisite course and that isn't considered full time. Okay. All right. Um, so Priya was saying it kind of a little when you were talking about residency requirements and grades. So I didn't quite hear. But is there a time limit for how old your grades are? No. Um, I.e. if I want to submit a course as a biology prerequisite that I took 10 years ago. Um, from my understanding, Nicole, there's that courses don't expire, right? That's correct. Okay. So that's, that's your answer, Priya. Um, Sophia asks, what if you are in co-op? Would it still be your last two semesters? Back to you, Nicole. Uh, if you're only working the co-op term and you have no full-time classes, then no, that does not count. Um, but if your co-op was mixed when you still had the, um, the full 2.5 credits or 15 credit hours, then that could still be considered. Um, but we don't, uh, we don't use just a co-op semester. Okay. Uh, Davina asks, can I use 2.25 credit courses as humanities courses? No. I didn't think so. Okay. Uh, Ariel, so if we have to complete two years of undergrad before we apply, does that mean we apply in winter of the third year to enter in fourth year? Yes, you can if you're ready. Um, that's usually what uh, a lot of people do. You can choose to finish your bachelor's degree if you want to do that um, and then apply. You can apply, uh, you know, a year out 
it's up to you. But the earliest you could apply is while you're in third year. So December 1st, uh, while you're in third year, you would, uh, you know, put your application, by that time, put your application in. And then after that, um, uh, submit all your materials for the deadlines. And then if you do end up getting accepted, then you wouldn't complete your bachelor's degree. You would just go into the DVM program. Okay. All right. Keely asks, I know they mentioned that if you are an out of promise student in Ontario, you do not qualify as an Ontario citizen unless living in Ontario for 12 years, 12 months working. What happens if you are an out of province graduate student at the University of Guelph? Can you still apply at Guelph? Uh, it's the same idea. If you're in full time studies, um, then that doesn't establish residency. You have to be outside of full-time studies um, and just I mean I don't mean high school or elementary school uh, post high school uh, so it's the same rule so you would have to um, either after your graduate degree take a year and establish that residency okay uh, so Caroline is there exceptions if the student holds an IEP which permits them from completing a 2.5 credit semester. Absolutely. So that's what I was saying. So if you have any reason why um, you can't do a full 2.5 semester or in other schools, it's I think 15 credit hours. Um, so then you would have to appeal uh, whatever semesters you wanted to appeal uh, and provide do supporting documentation. Um, and um, Nicole, do you want to tell them what that might entail if they have an IEP? Sure. Sorry, you're talking about for the appeal. You just cut out a little bit and I missed it. Yes. Sorry about that, guys. So IEP. Yeah, if they have like a um, diagnosed learning disability. Um, mm -hmm then what would you suggest they, su they submit as a supporting document? Sure, I would suggest that you submit as much documentation as you think would support your, uh, your request for appeal. And that would include things like your registration with your university and your student accessibility services or whatever the comparable department is there. Um, any medical letters that you might have, uh, psycho, um, psychotherapy assessments or psycho assessments, um, uh, psycho ed assessments is what I'm looking for. Anything like that, um, that would back up your, uh, your request. Um, a documentation that is current so I would say if you're requesting something for um, upcoming years that you take part-time semesters that you have the documentation that would back that up. Excellent thanks Nicole. Um, okay so Yara has asked how many applications for international students do you receive per year? So we have all those statistics up on our website. I'm going to put up the one from the last cycle which will tell you all those numbers um, and it will be on a slide coming up. So um, it depends on the year. So normally we see, I'm trying to remember Nicole, it's like 200-ish of those that actually follow through on their application and it's on an inter like an internationally run uh, online system called VIMCAS, uh, which is V-M-C-A-S and it's uh, housed in the States. Uh, will the presence of an IEP disability hinder a student's ability to be competitive? No, I don't think so. Uh, Maggie, hi. How would how, would you be able to use grades from a semester made inadmissible because you took less than sixty percent, um, three hundred, four hundred level courses uh, when you had over ten credits as prerequisite? So the rule is is if you don't follow the rules, uh, like the sixty forty rule that you just quoted, um, the whole semester is inadmissible and all the courses in it are inadmissible. So um, you have to be careful that you follow all the rules and if you have any questions about whether or not um, a semester is admissible then I would submit it for um, to the registrar's office uh, um, and uh, make sure that everything is uh, usable. So Mia asks, so we can take past grades for fall 20 as well uh, I don't know if that's being offered, is it? Nicole, do you know what they're doing about pass fails? Nope, I don't know anything about that at this point. And so we've, the, we've only made the decision on winter. 
Yeah, I don't even I don't know that uh, universities have I don't know about hours. Um, I don't know if they're going to be issuing that uh, option for people. Um, I think every university has made really great progress in offering courses online. Um, so I'm not sure if there's going to be that option, but um, if if that ends up happening, we'll definitely post that on our website and let you know that. Um, Sarah asks, does a one credit biology course taken in one semester, not a full year, cover both biological science courses? I believe that is yes, right, Nicole? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Um, Katrina asks, will pass fail option be available for this fall semester at all? Your guess is as good as mine. We will find that out. Um, Miriam asks, how important is employment? We're getting there. I just want questions right now about the academic pieces, um, and we'll get to the employment pieces. Um, is there a time limit for how recent your vet experience? OK, that's going to be coming up later. Um, Maggie asks, you mentioned the list of prerequisite courses, such as two biological sciences. Is that equivalent to two credits? Um, it's equivalent, so two biological sciences is equivalent to one credit in at Guelph, uh, and it's equivalent to um, if you're doing like a full time one semester course is uh, three credits, then that would be six. Um, it's two, uh, so it's two courses that are a full time one semester course. Tracy asks, can you apply as an undergraduate even after graduating? I think I did say that, but yes, you can apply anytime you want. You can, you can have a master's degree and still apply in the undergraduate pool. Um, it's all about how, what's best for you and what's going to sell you best, right? Um, so Sophia says, sorry to clarify my co-op question. I had full-time studies last fall, an eight-month co-op term, but now full-time studies this semester. So I would use my fall 19 and fall 20, question mark? Nicole, that's, your, that's a question for you. Potentially. Uh, hard to answer without actually seeing your transcript. So if you wanted to get that uh, looked at, then you could send it to admdvm at uogolf.ca and we could take a better look at it. I don't want to tell you one thing without actually seeing your transcript and then misguiding you. Okay, perfect. Okay. Good question, Maggie. So Maggie asks, can you apply multiple times if you don't get accepted the first time? Um, this is later on my slides too, but uh, right now there's a cap on how often you can apply to OVC and it's four times. So word of advice, do not apply just to try it out. Apply when you're serious and ready. All right, uh, Margaret asks, so you could take vet prerequisites during the fall semester or third year, a uh, third year, and apply by winter semester. Yeah, uh, you could apply, uh, you could take, that's right, so fall, some, fall of third year and apply in winter of fourth year. I think that's what you're asking, right, Margaret? Do I have it right? Okay. Uh, Juliana, how will the interview process work this year? Will there still be MMIs? So I'm going to talk about that later. We're just talking about courses right now, okay? Um, yeah. All right, so. All right, good question. So Emma asks, if I am living in Ontario for the past 20 years and I am offered a job in another province starting in November, will I still be eligible for Guelph if I'm not still a current Ontario resident? So right now, yes, that is true. You would still be able to qualify as an Ontario resident because you've accumulated over 12 months living in Ontario. Um, our definition of residency may change in the future um, to reflect the definition of uh, other levels of government, uh, being that it has to be the most recent 12 months, but that's not our definition just now. So um, if that does change, um, and if there's any major changes in our admissions that mean that you have to take an extra step or an extra course, we would announce it one year 
and then uh, apply it two years later. So we'd give you like a two year warning that that was uh, a change in admissions. Okay, um, if you have more than 10 credits, uh, more than 60 credits, uh, okay, am I able to take three thousand level courses for all my courses for the last full time? Yes, okay. So um, what you're referring to is the 60-40 rule. So that the 60-40 rule is that after you've done uh, what we consider to be four semesters uh, or the equivalent of, um, of that in credits, then after that you have to take at least 60% of your courses for each semester at the 30, 300 or 3000 or, or 4000 level. Um, so those are interchangeable and the rest can be whatever level you want. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, I'm getting some questions about the rest of the presentation. So let's go back to the presentation and um, let's see if I can find the rest of the presentation. And um, I'll just go on and then we'll come back to the questions, okay? Because otherwise I won't be able to uh, finish. So where is my screen? There it is. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so when you apply, after you've done the academic stuff, um, there's a, a deadline in February uh, for you to submit your background information form. And this is where all the non-academic stuff goes in, uh, which is the stuff that you're gonna be preparing uh, as well as doing all of the coursework. Um, so what we look for uh, is we look for your veterinary experience. I'm gonna explain all this uh, as we go. Um, animal experience, extracurricular activities, uh, employment, uh, and you're, you're going to need um, three referee assessments, two from veterinarians and one other. The third one can be a veterinarian, um, but uh, you know if you've done some really great volunteering somewhere or you've uh, done a really stellar work in a job, then you can use your supervisor for that. And then you'll be writing three essays as part of that uh, background information form. So, and then um, the interviews. I will be talking more in detail about all the other stuff, don't worry. Uh, so pre-COVID, we did uh, the multiple mini interviews. Um, and uh, it became 35% of the final ranking for everyone. Uh, so there's... For those of you who don't know already about MMIs, it's an 80-minute circuit of, um, actually it's nine now, it's a 90-minute circuit of 10-minute uh, stations because now we have two background information stations. Um, and um, of those nine stations, uh, seven of those are scenario-based. Uh, so basically you're given uh, a a situation or a scenario, uh, this happens, uh, and then you're asked some questions, either what do you think or what do you do, what's the best thing um, that you think might uh, be an outcome. And then um, the scenarios are not necessarily veterinary based, uh, but they are looking for specific skills. Um, and then there are now two BIF stations that changed um, for this year. So um, the BIF stations are questions about what you've written in your background information form and um, allows you to talk a bit about your experience. And uh, there are just some reasons why we use the MMI instead of uh, the panel interview. Um, it's uh, much less subjective. It allows uh, more people to interview you and there are uh, grids that they fill in based on uh, you being able to um, cover specific points in your answer. No wrong or right, but just that you cover in your explanation of what you think would be the best outcome or um, uh, strategy for that quest that scenario um, and why. And uh, so for the MMIs, uh, sorry, the number's still at eight, so we would have instead of 16, 18 assessors and nine stations. Um, and this year what we did in the face of COVID is we couldn't do the MMI. So what we did was we did uh, a, um, a two-tiered interview. So uh, 
we did an online CASPER 90-minute assessment. So CASPER stands for Computer-Based Assessment for Sampling Personal Characteristics. Um, that's a mouthful. And um, uh, it's uh, an online, uh, almost like an MMI. There are scenarios and questions that you uh, type in what you, or you get videoed uh, as to what your response would be. And um, then the second piece of our interview process for the last cycle was we did um, um, teams uh, meetings with each candidate with two faculty members. Um, and it was pretty much uh, si uh, similar to the BIF station uh, where they asked about um, the person's experiences and um, things they've done. Uh, that was of, an, of interest, so they got a chance to meet you and hear a bit about your story, which is always uh, very important to us. Um, so, uh, let me just make sure I'm talking about, okay, so let's go back uh, to um, to talking about experience, because I didn't get it. I, did, I should have done it back then, but I didn't. Uh, so, um, we look at, and I'll just go back to the slide, sorry, where's my cursor? There it is. Okay, oops, sorry about that. All right, so veterinary experience. Veterinary experience um, is uh, experience that you've accumulated working with a veterinarian. So the veterinarian has to be there uh, in the room with you to count as veterinary experience. Um, so a lot of people ask, you know, well, I've worked in a clinic and I clean cages and I did reception and I also shadow, shadow the vet. So what you need to do is log all of your experience and separate it out by um, how much time you did each. So um, the the stuff with cleaning cages and animal handling is animal experience if the vet was not there. If the vet was with you and you were watching how they were interacting with clients or doing surgery, that kind of stuff, that's veterinary experience. And if it was reception where you didn't work it with any of the animals, that's extracurricular employment. So that's where that would go. So one clinic can appear in three parts of your BIF, but different hours, right? Um, and we also ask uh, in the background information form for someone uh, to uh, act as a, an, a, a validator for all these experiences. They can be the same person or they can be different people. So um, that's the difference between veterinary experience and animal experience. Uh, extracurricular activities and employment are very important because um, you working with people and uh, you know volunteering in the community really helps hone those skills that are related to working as a veterinarian because as everyone will tell you uh, veterinary medicine is so much about people right it's a every animal you're going to see usually comes with a human attached to it unless you maybe work with wildlife but even so if you work in a clinic or work in uh, research or work in government or work in uh, the industry um, you're going to work with other people you're very rarely going to be all alone. Uh, so it's really important that as a veterinarian, you work well with other people. Uh, and those uh, jobs and extracurricular activities really um, tell us that you've gone that extra mile to get that kind of experience. Um, and it's important that you have that. So uh, you are going to be asked about it in the interviews. So that's one thing. Um, but it's a, a really good idea to learn how to work well with people. I guess that's pretty obvious, right? Um, all right, so let's go back to where we were before. So let's just review the actual way people are assessed. So everyone applies in December, um, and then uh, in uh, when, you, when you apply, uh, it's just putting your name in uh, through the system. Then in February, uh, you submit your background information form, and that's when you send in your marks. So the registrar's office verifies everybody's application, and then uh, you get uh, um, your admissions average, which is the 50-50 calculation of your eight prerequisites in the last two full-time semesters. Um, and then um, everyone who is in uh, the top 
well this year it was 240 um but you know the the top of the list um ranked by that uh, admissions average uh the admissions committee uh reads over everybody's background information form and uh reviews it and um then it's decided uh, who will be invited for interviews so there is uh that a screening process there so it's very important that everything in your background inform information form um, and your application is uh, is of a high quality. So um, it's, it's not unusual for people to be removed from the admission cycle after this review. And um, the main reason that people do get uh, removed from the cycle is by having a negative reference or a, not a subpar reference, especially from a veterinarian. So I urge you, anytime you ask for a reference from anyone, please make sure that they uh, commit to writing you a really uh, great reference. Ask them if they're comfortable doing that. If they hesitate, or if they say, well, I don't feel I know you well enough to write you a really great letter, then don't pursue it. You need really good letters of reference, uh, especially from veterinarians, because um, veterinarians are telling us whether or not they feel that you would be a good addition to the profession. And if they're not sure, if they don't think that you will be, then um, that's something that can really impact your application. So be, be very mindful when you're asking for letters of reference for your application. Okay. Then we do interviews, and for the person who asked uh, how, what we're going to do this year, we don't know. We're going to decide that next semester. Um, we don't know what's happening in terms of um, our ability to have people on site, if we're going to do the MMIs, if we have to do an online mix again. Um, so that will be announced as soon as it's decided by the admissions committee, um, and we'll announce it on our website. So we have the interviews. We usually interview about uh, 200 or more. Um, and then um, after the interviews, the, we re-rank everybody. So the initial admissions average is 65%. And then the interview mark is 35%. Um, and then we re-rank everyone, um, review everyone by the admissions committee, make sure that there was no um, um, Nothing unusual that happened in, in the interviews, uh, and then uh, there's uh, then we send out the um, the notice uh, on WebAdvisor whether or not you have an offer or if you don't. So that's how that cycle works. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people are interested about uh, how the what the cycle looked like this year. Um, so unfortunately, because of COVID, I don't have a class picture for the incoming class because of, well, social distancing. Um, so this is the class that's in second year now. So I'm reusing their picture. Um, and uh, those are the um, otters, the, oh my gosh, my mind's blanking, the opal otters. That's, so every class has a um, mascot and uh, that's their mascot. So this is uh, the applicant numbers for the last cycle. Um, we had a total of uh, 398 applicants um, for the domestic undergraduate pool. And Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the number of people who had a complete uh, application um, and were able to go forward. That's right. Okay, perfect. That sometimes we get people who are missing things and um, and uh, they don't get uh, to the stage. So uh, the number of people who actually may have applied is higher, but this is the number of people that um, had all all their um, boxes checked. Um, then uh, the interview two hundred and the median grade for them was about 90.56 so i should say that um the top two marks are not very different from last year they're a little bit higher um and then uh the median grade for uh the admitted applicants for this pool uh was a bit higher it was 92.2 percent okay so i'm um, just gonna 
finish this uh, because I may answer your questions as I go through this. Um, and then um, for the then I'll introduce the Future Vets Club folks and then I'll answer questions, okay? So um, as you probably can tell from my uh, presentation so far, uh, Academics are incredibly important for this admissions process, and that's where you have the greatest uh, ability to make sure that you get it to the interview, get to the interview, sorry, and um, uh, make it into the class. So you really have to um, make sure that you're doing everything uh, the way the way that we're going to accept a, a mark. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that you're following all the rules and make sure that you're full time um, if you can be and you're taking your prerequisites in full time semesters and you want to make sure that you're choosing the highest marks, um, not the marks of courses you think will find impressive, the highest marks. And uh, I think that's why the marks are going up every year too is because people are getting um, better at uh, at learning to have to apply appropriately. So that's why a lot of the, the marks are going up. Um, and uh, if you need help, get help. Don't let your academics uh, hold you back. We've had a few people who um, when they first got to university had an undiagnosed learning disability and once they um, got diagnosed and uh, learned the strategies that helped them they did super well and they got into the program so um, there's that there's always tutoring um, get support um, I should say that the uh, veterinary program itself is very um, content heavy so it's 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 difficult challenging um, however uh, we strongly uh, encourage cooperation we don't want our students to be competitive with each other because they're going to be uh, colleagues in the future and they're um, part of the veterinary profession once they get in that uh, in the program so um, please support your fellow students help each other uh, and um, it's really important that um, that you you know that we're in it together and uh, helping others will not necessarily mean that you won't get in uh, so please uh, support each other okay uh, how can I improve my animal and veterinary experience so writing is the key um, you know, it doesn't have to be clinical but we do like you to get a variety of experience with different animals just because once you start here, you're going to be working with all kinds of animals pretty much even in the first year. And if you've never touched a cow or a horse before, it's going to be a little intimidating. But you know what? You're going to learn it. Um, and uh, we do want, it, it's not so much about hours. Like um, accumulating hours is one thing, but we do look for quality. We do look for what you've learned while you were working in a vet clinic or working alongside a veterinarian. Um, so it's really important that you understand what they do day to day and what the profession holds and uh, also a really good idea to not just keep your experience to one clinic um, because each clinic is a little different and they work differently so that's a good lesson to learn or a good experience to have. Um, be sure that you're already starting to log what you do and uh, again uh, what was animal experience what was vet experience and who the vet is that you worked with as well as what was um, um, extracurricular work experience um, and uh, we do ask that at least some of your experience be within north america uh, this is a North American based program, so um, the content of the curriculum um, is training you to be a veterinarian in North America. Um, so it's good to know what you're getting into by having that experience. And uh, yeah, so there's no right or wrong in terms of experience. Uh, one thing that uh, I like to plug at this point is the fact that if you're at the University of Guelph, we have a lot of veterinarians that are faculty here and they do hire summer students to work with them and that counts as veterinary experience because you're learning what veterinarians do in research. If you are not at the University of Guelph, 
most larger universities have uh, an animal care facility that is that that has to have a veterinarian on staff. So um, that's another uh, way you can get some experience that possibly is close to home. Um, not sure if they're getting uh, they're accepting volunteers now with COVID, but uh, um, if it's uh, you know if the if you can email them um, and uh, find out if they might even do like an online um, information interview with you and tell them a bit about their career. It's great to explore, try everything. We certainly support our students in that. There's so many things you can do with a veterinary degree. We really want you to get that exposure and, and get uh, at least uh, a sense of the realm of opportunity that will await you as a veterinarian. Um, some questions I usually get about referee assessments. Uh, again, you have to have worked with the veterinarian to um, get a reference for them. That would count as a veterinary experience. Uh, some people, if you're in an undergrad course and your and your professor was a veterinarian and you didn't interact with him except for that course, that is not a good choice as a veterinary experience because they won't be able to really assess you. If you volunteered with them um, or work with them over the summer, that's different. But if it's just a faculty member that you've only interacted with um, as, a, as a professor, um, they may not know you well enough to really give you a good assessment. Um, again, none of your referees should be uh, related to you in any way or be friends of the family or be your friends or be your roommates. I think that's kind of self-evident that all of your applicate your um, referee assessment should be professional someone that you worked for um, if it's an experience that happened a while ago um, the person may have moved but they could still be the reference for you for that particular experience so if like say a veterinarian has moved clinics you would just still you'd still put them down or you put the manager of the clinic if they if they remember you so uh, just some, uh, and I think in the questions, it was like, uh, do, does experience expire? Well, I think the answer is no. Uh, like for instance, if you did uh, uh, your 40 hours of volunteer work or co-op in high school with the vet clinic, uh, you could certainly put that in. But if that's your most recent experience with a, a vet or your only experience, the admissions committee might wonder uh, how committed you are to veterinary medicine if you haven't really done anything since then. Makes sense? Okay, so here are the three essays um, that we had. Um, Nicole, have they changed this year? Sorry, I lost my no, no, they haven't. They haven't. Okay, so these are the, the three essays that you'll be asked to answer. Um, so uh, this will be on the video, and um, I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise. We're asking you to comment on specific areas of your understanding uh, or your experience of veterinary medicine. Um, so um, that will be part of the background information form that you fill in. Um, and then interview skills, how can I improve that? Um, well, there's, it's pretty much you know, a given that you need to have good communication skills. Um, you can take public speaking courses, the workshops available at, pre, I would think every university offers those uh, workshops. Uh, Toastmasters is a great uh, um, kind of nonprofit uh, where you can um, practice your public speaking skills. And if we do decide to do the MMIs this year, um, the Future Vets Club normally holds mock MMIs. Um, uh, and I think some universities do. I think the University of Guelph, University of Guelph offers MMI training now um, that you can sign up for. Uh, OK, so I think this might be, let me just see what else I have. Um, Oops, sorry. So I've applied four times or my marks are not competitive. So um, if you are not likely or can't get into OVC, there's a few options. You don't have to, um, like your dream of being a veterinarian doesn't have to die. Um, there are other vet schools in Canada and every single one of them requires residency in their territory except for Quebec. Quebec will accept you if you are a francophone 
and um, you have to pass a language test, but you'll be doing the uh, program in French. Uh, so if that, uh, if you're able to do that, you can think about attending the school in St. Hyacinth. Otherwise, um, check out the other vet schools in Canada. It would mean that you probably have to establish 12 months of re residency before you apply there. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, it's an option. Um, make sure if you're going to go to a school outside of North America that the, it is AVMA accredited. And um, uh, some of the schools uh, that are accredited are, I think most of the UK schools are accredited. So are a couple of schools in the Caribbean and um, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So those are the ones I know of. Uh, many of the schools in Europe are not. So uh, it would just mean that if you wanted to come back um, to Canada and practice after you did your vet degree in a non-accredited uh, facility, you would have to uh, write two exams instead of one. Um, so it's that's a difference. Okay. Um, anyway, that's not, not something you have to know right at this moment. Uh, so if you have any questions, that, that med at uoguelph.ca is my uh, email for uh, admissions questions. However, um, ADM DVM at your Guelph is where you would send things like appeals or course approvals, things like that. Okay, so let's go back to the. Okay, I'm just gonna put this down here. Okay, so um, before we continue, um, let's uh, stop sharing. Um, so, Future Vets Club. Do we have either of the co-presidents here? Tula, I see you. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah hi. hi. Tula, uh, I'm in your and, 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 and I'm and a president of the Vets Club. Do you want to talk just a bit about what uh, Future Vets Club does? Yeah, for sure. So our uh, Vets Club is an event-based club, and we run a lot of events helping with uh, veterinary networking, uh, different animal-related events. And again, like Elizabeth said earlier, we usually run the mock MMIs um, and more information coming on what we're doing for that this year because we're still not sure. Um, and we also have social media that lets you know about different online opportunities and we connect with international universities and uh, lots of other information, which you can find on Griff Life and also on our social media. And Facebook. And Facebook. Yes. Yeah. So if you're from another university, um, you can check out the Facebook group. What's the name of the Facebook group? It's FBC Guelph. Excellent. OK, great. Um, and is, uh, is, uh, who else is here from the Future Vets Club? Is no one here? Yes, no one Hello. here. Hey, Noam. Hi, I'm Noam Eaney. I'm in the third year zoology, and I'm the other co-president of the Future Vets Club. Great. Anyone else from Future Vets Club? Just turn on your microphone and your camera. Oh, hey. Uh, uh -huh. I'm Anya. I am one of the events coordinators for the Future Vets Club this year. Do you want me to turn on your camera just so everyone sees you? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ananya. Yeah. Anyone else? Hi, everyone. I'm Kyla, and I'm the communications officer this year. Excellent. Anyone else? So if you want to email the Future Vets Club, it's fvc at uoguelph.ca. Danica, did you want to go on? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Danica. Um, I'm the senior editor of the Future Vets Club, and I'm in my third year of biomedical science. Your voice is very low. Can you go closer to the microphone? Okay. Do you want to tell people about uh, what you edit? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we edit pieces uh, that are sent by uh, veterinarians or vet students. Um, and undergraduate students and um, yeah so if you guys have any um, ideas on 
or have anything that you would like to write about for Black Beyond Myth and Malice, um, you can uh, send us a message. Um, and you can also check out our blog at uh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. And if you want to, if any of you want to put anything in the chat, uh, just for people like uh, an email or uh, a message, that's fine. Okay. So let's go back to the questions. Um, so Emily asks, do references need to all come from different clinics? For example, I could get references from two vets and a manager from the same clinic or do my references need to all work at different establishments? It's fine. You can have um, the references all from the same clinic, um, but I would suggest that you don't just get experience from one clinic, just for your own sake, just for you to have uh, sort of a more breadth of experience and um, more, more stuff under your belt. That's it. Okay, Kate asks, if you're studying undergrad out of province but lived in Ontario until leaving for university, do you still qualify as an Ontario resident? Absolutely. Um, so really, you can go anywhere for your undergrad. It doesn't mean you are a resident there. Like I could go do a bachelor's in the United States. It doesn't make me American, right? So really, it's where you live outside of post-secondary studies that we're interested in. Okay, Alicia. Um, how will the two semester average be calculated if we have chosen a pass to pass a class instead of having a numerical grade? Will it be an average of all the classes spanning the two semesters or it will be an average of the semester averages? Okay, Alicia, why don't you come on if that's okay with you and Nicole can um, answer because I'm not sure I understand that. Nicole, did you understand I that? I think I understand it, yep. So we okay. would be doing an average of the courses that have grades across those two semesters. So we don't combine the average from semester one and the average to semester two. We look, we do an average of the courses that have grades. Oh, perfect. Okay. Alicia, does that clarify for you? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, okay, so Yvonne, I did say that we don't look for a specific number of hours. There's no minimum for vet experience. Um, however, um, the more the better. Uh, and that's not necessarily just for admissions. It's for you too. We really want you to have explored the career and gotten a really firm grasp about what veteran veterinarians do day to day. And really the only way to know that is to experience it, right? So as much as you can get experience, and it doesn't have to be clinical, like I said, it can be in all different sectors. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no minimum, it's more quality that we want. Yes, this is being recorded and it will be posted um, publicly on the OVC YouTube channel. Uh, hello, will the interviews be in my format or Casper this year? Don't know, but we will see, we will, we'll announce it as soon as we know. Does extracurricular experience include high school extracurricular experience as well? Yes, I would say that can, but by the time you apply, you realize that's going to be like three, four years out, right? So hopefully you've done some stuff since then. Okay. Um, so, uh, Veronica, are you asking a specific question about a course? So that, uh, well, this isn't the form for that. You need to send that to uh, the registrar. Um, Sophia, are we able to use courses as prerequisites from our first and second years of undergrad? Absolutely. There, we don't say that you have to take the prerequisites later. Um, it can be from any semester. If you got like 99 in the course in your first semester of university and it's suitable as a prerequisite, then go ahead and use it. Um, Ainsley says courses will not be acceptable if they are taken at the same or lower level in the subject area that previously passed courses in the same subject area. Okay, so that's basically that we don't want you to repeat substantial amounts of content from one course to another. We don't let you repeat courses that are passed. So if you fail the course and you have to take it again, then of course that's fine. Um, but if you've passed a course and you want to take it again to get a better mark, we do not accept that. You have to take 
uh, let's say you've taken a stats course and you don't like the grades you got, you have to take uh, the next level up stats course that, uh, for example, would take the course you've taken already as a prerequisite for it. Um, uh, the rule is really about repeating content. So, um, like, there are several two, let's say, 2,000 or 200 level geography courses that are completely different in content. So, if you take two of those, they're not repeats. They're not the same in terms of what they're what you're learning, but you can't repeat content. So that's the biggest rule you have to follow. If you don't know, if you're not sure, then send your, your proposed courses to ADM DVM and they'll take a look. Um, but you have to send them the course descriptions of the course that uh, is the lower level and the next course that you want to take. Okay? When is the deadline to apply to the program? If I need one year of residency and move to Ontario immediately after finishing a bachelor's degree and then live there from May to May, would I still be able to apply to start that August since we start in September? Uh, so the answer is your 12 months have to be done by the application deadline of December 1st. I'm correct, right, Nicole? Yes, that's correct, yes. December 1st. Right, December 1st. So you have to have been, um, let's say, for instance, you're applying for uh, to enter fall 21, so next year. You have had to have been an Ontario resident from before for 12 months before um, this coming December 1st. Okay? Is that clear, Escrava? Yes, no? Okay. Nathan asks, do we need to work with the veterinarians for a certain amount of time to be able to submit them as references? That's a pretty good question. Um, I would say it is about them knowing you. So um, I don't know if there's a number I would put on that, but I would say that uh, you should talk about it with the, with the veterinarian. Like, do they feel they know you well enough to be able to give you a really good reference? Um, so, uh, you know, obviously I think a day is not enough, um, and I don't think you need to do a whole year, but I think, Nathan, that's a good question, but that's a question that I think the referee has to answer. Okay. Allison asks, how do we count our hours for extracurriculars such as clubs if we are not on the exec team? Do we include the trips and events we've been to? Excellent question. Um, so extracurriculars, uh, like I said, are ways in which you hone your skills working with people. So attending an event is not that. Um, if you're a member of the Future Vets Club, for example, and all you do is go to events, then I wouldn't say that that's an extracurricular activity. It's like going to a lecture, right, or going to a movie. Um, it's not really something where you're gaining a skill. You're gaining information, but it's not skill worthy, if you want to put it that way. Um, so I would say you have to help, like you have to volunteer, you have to, you don't necessarily have to be on the executive, but um, at least you, you know, if you volunteered as a helper or volunteer at specific events, you can put that down. I mean, it won't be a lot of hours, but it'll be useful, okay? Um, Caroline asks, does extracurricular experience include high school? Okay, I've already answered that. Regarding the professional reference needed, would a master's student that you did research for be an acceptable reference? Yep, I would say so. Um, can you get two letters of reference from two veterans you worked with from the same, practice, same experience? Yes. Where in the experience section do you put research experience? I would say that would be, if it's veterinary experience, uh, like if it's with a veterinarian, it would be veterinary experience. Uh, otherwise, it would go under uh, the same thing as employment. Um, can all three of your referee assessments be from the same clinic? Boy, I think we have a repetitive question there. Um, are marks expected to be higher this year due to online learning and concerns about cheating? I don't know. Would you be able to give us the range of those accepted? Oh, um, I don't know that I have that handy. 
I definitely do not. I don't have that handy. Um, it will be on what I'm going to put up, I think. I think it's it's the range is on the stat sheet that I'm going to put up on the on the website. Um, so, sorry about that. I didn't have that. Okay, look for the look for the hand look for the stats that are going to be posted. Sorry, I'm running out of steam now. Um, does the admitted applicants median include the interview scores or just the sixty five per percent portion? Uh, it's it's both, right, Nicole? I think it's uh, the 6535. Um, yes. oh gosh, I can't remember. I wish I could find that. Um, tucked away in email. <laughs> questions. Um, Let me see if I can. Yeah, okay, go take a look and, and uh, we'll get back to you, Nicole. Allison asks, is there a certain amount of hours required uh, for the extracurriculars employment section? There's no um, minimum. Um, again, it's about quality, but uh, I would uh, I would not like to see an empty section. So, if you have nothing to put in a specific section, like extracurriculars, um, you know, um, it's not a great thing. I would try to have a little bit of volunteer experience or some kind of extracurricular experience under my belt. And you can go back a few years, right? Like we said, you can put it in high school. Okay, um, I, Tracy, I've already commented on taking, retaking courses. Do you have any other questions from that? Is that okay? Emma asks, do you know what the admission stats for the grad cohort was for the last cycle? Um, I don't know it off by heart, um, and I'm not sure we release that information because it's different. Um, it's not just based, because we look at, like the admission stats is not uh, the same as the 6535. It's a mix of undergrad, grad marks, productivity. There's a whole calculation that they do, so it's a little bit different. Um, but um, I'll check and see if it's on that uh, spreadsheet that I'm going to put up. If not, email me, okay? Uh, Miriam asked, does it matter when did you volunteer? Well, um, I think that if uh, the only thing you did was what you did in high school and you haven't done anything since, uh, specifically around uh, veterinary experience, then that might be found upon by the, vet by the admissions committee uh, because they're going to wonder, well, how committed are you to this career and how much have you really done to know the realities of being a veterinarian? Um, but, I mean, you can put stuff down from as far back as you want. I wouldn't say past high school, uh, but um, no, we don't say that it has, like, we don't put on it that it has to be within the last five years. Okay, uh, Katrina, in regards to applying, I read on a calendar somewhere at the UG website that internal applicants should be applying by October 1st. Is this correct? That's international, that's not domestic. Um, so, or should everybody be applying? It's all, it's December first for everybody. Um, the the application site opens earlier, um, so please don't wait till the last minute because sometimes there are technical issues. So, if you're on the computer like at midnight December first and things aren't happening for you, that's not going to be fun. Fun. Um, please don't wait until December first to do it. <laughs> but uh, it's December 1st for Canadians. Okay. If I took a course-based master's but wish to apply in the undergrad cohort, am I able to write about my master's on the BIF at all? Yeah, sure, absolutely. You can write in it um, uh, in uh, the essay. You can include some of that uh, if it helps you decide one way or the other where you want to go. Um, uh, your master's is course-based, so you, we wouldn't use um, marks from there unless you took an undergrad upgrade mark. Um, Nicole, do you know if there's anything else they can put in? I think uh, it's, yeah, there's other, other than extracurricular. Yeah, I think whatever you think it might fit the best. Yeah, yeah, I think that's up to you if you want to put it in. Um, because, you know, a master's, if you do research, it's a little more than just a course, but you can definitely talk about it in your essays. I know that. 
Hi, Elizabeth. Sorry, I was the one that asked the question about the masters. Um, I also, it wasn't included in the question, but if I do have a published paper, am I allowed to put that anywhere on the BIF? I know that I'm not applying in the graduate cohort, but does that count? Uh, uh, no, I don't think there's really a place for it. Um, I don't think so, but you can okay. mention you published a paper in the essay, right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Allison asks, when asking people to verify our hours, what contact information do we need of them? And when an OVC faculty contacts them, do we ask any other que do they ask any other questions besides the total hours the applicant did? Okay, so that's two totally separate things. So one, um, usually we just ask for a, a name and a phone number, I believe, and it's just for verification. Um, we don't call everyone. Can you imagine calling like 200 times three, everybody, um, all their references, uh, their, their refer, sorry, their validators. Um, so no, they don't call everybody. Um, it's just if there's like something that doesn't drive, like sometimes what happens is um, a veterinarian who uh, um, is giving you a reference and says that you worked with them for 10 hours and you put a thousand hours in your BIF, then we might contact them just to verify was that a typo um, because that's a big difference, right? Uh, so it's really just um, uh, in case there's a question, but we do not necessarily reach out to all the validators, but we do need to have them in case there's a, a question. Okay, is that good, Allison? Yes, that's good, thank you. Okay, Lana asks, will the admissions committee be more lenient when it comes to experience range quantity because of COVID? Most clinics and research labs I've contacted have suspended volunteering, including OVC. Uh, so um, the answer is probably, uh, we're gonna uh, in a future meeting discuss this, but it is on the agenda uh, for us to talk about um, um, but hopefully um, you've all not waited till this year to do your volunteer experience. But yes, it is a bit challenging. Um, and um, yeah, it's not not a great uh, time for that kind of thing. Uh, so we definitely understand that and we're definitely going to consider that. And how we'll consider that, it will be up to the committee in a meeting coming in the next couple of months. And once they have uh, decision and we have wording that's going to go up on the website so just keep a lookout for that okay so if you ask is there a minimum amount of hours no uh, what's considered a competitive average I think you just have to look at what the averages are and uh, be as close as you can to that uh, Giselle asks, if the admissions committee decides to do CASPER again this year, will applicants be able to withdraw without losing one of their four application attempts? Um, not sure. They did it this year, uh, I think, because it was new um, and it was because of COVID. But uh, a lot of vet schools and med schools are using CASPER um, as part of their admissions pro pro process. Uh, so. I, I'm not sure that we would do that again, but again, if that is something that uh, uh, they decide to do this year, that will be posted on our website so everyone will know. Okay. Sorry, Lana, I don't have some headphones I can use right now with a built-in mic. So I'm, I apologize for the sound quality if people are having issues. Okay, so Nathan asks, are non growth students allowed to attend events? So I think you're talking about Future Vets Club. And yes, I would believe that uh, now that they're all virtual, they will be open. Um, email fvc at uoguelph.ca and um, uh, you can find out uh, how to get on that listserv or to find out when events are happening. Yep, that's right. So you've got it, Nathan. That's the right email address in the chat. Um, excellent. Okay, I've answered that. Okay. Uh, Maggie is from a different province in Canada, but I do my undergrad studies in Ontario. 
Does that satisfy my one year residency? Unfortunately not, Maggie. Um, so uh, time spent at a university does not make you a resident. Um, so you would need to accumulate those 12 months of residency outside of your uh, program. Um, and it'll be a great opportunity for you to volunteer a little bit with uh, veterinarians if you can uh, here in Ontario. Okay. All right. Good question, Alyssa. So Alyssa asks, if you took a higher level course in the same subject area and ended up with a lower grade, can you still use the lower level version as a prerequisite? Absolutely. You choose, right? So if you've taken 20 statistics, um, I know people are going, no, but if you, for example, took 20 different statistics, you just choose the one that has the highest mark from any semester that is full time and a hat that you follow all the rules. Okay. Um, oh, okay, uh, Nicole, I think this is for you. Um, how many people apply that do not check all the boxes? Remember, we talked about the fact that the number of people who start an application is higher than the number of ap actual applicants. Are you notified if there was a problem with your application to prevent you making this mistake next year? Sure. So we, I believe that it was just under 500. If I recall, I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but I feel like it was just so under 500. Um, notified if there's a problem with your application. So we would, I believe that there's, I'm trying to think, this is my first cycle through, so I'm trying to remember what all the steps were. Um, the ones that didn't carry on, I believe we closed out the application at that point. So I think we refused at that point. Um, but I'd have to double check that. I can't remember exactly what we did. That all kind of happened right at the as COVID was starting, and it's all a bit of a blur. <laughs> do, you, do you remember if you reached out to anyone? Like I remember uh, a while ago, it, sometimes someone would um, only have two references or not have two vet references, but have like one vet and two other people. Um, I don't know that given that this is a professional medical program and you're applying, I mean, it's really uh, the onus of the applicant to make sure that they understand everything they need to submit. Um, but um, would you reach out, Nicole? Do you know if that is done? So I'm not sure that that is actually done. So if reference had to come across and they weren't checking all the right boxes, we wouldn't actually know that until we started reviewing. So. Um, I, I don't know that there's just so many of them that they're, we're not checking them as they're coming in. There's a point when they're all in and then we start to do the review. So right. um, so it's not, I don't believe that we would be keeping track of who is following the rules on references, for example, and who's not. So that really is the, uh, the up to the applicant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Caroline asks, can we apply with a class we took during a full-time semester, but in a DE course delivery? Absolutely. Uh, I didn't touch on this in my talk, but distance education courses um, are uh, treated the same way as uh, a regular course, and now they're all virtual anyway, um, but uh, uh, you have to make sure that the timing is within the same time period, right? So it has to be within a full-time semester taken at the same time as the other courses that you're taking. So you can have five DE courses, but they have to be all, uh, what's the word, um, accomplished, uh, completed within uh, the period of one semester. So uh, start in September, end before the end of December, right, Nicole? Uh, or yep. Uh, January to uh, April, mid, end of April, or May to August. So the, it has to fall, um, completion of that, start and completion have to be within those months, those four months, to count as a semester course, and you have to have five total. Okay. Um, Caroline, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No problem. Okay, Christian asks, as a University of Guelph student, when is the earliest you can submit your transfer to the DVM program? Um, I think it opens in October. Am I yeah, right? it's very soon, within the next couple of weeks. Yeah. 
Get your room started! Woo! Exciting! Okay, Gabriella asks, since the BIF is due in February, may we continue building experience for non-academic requirements or should that be completed by December? Oh no, you can go all the way until the end of January. Um, so what happens is that you have to submit everything by, I think, midnight, uh, February 1st, right? Um, so you can continue accumulating, but as of February 1st, that's when everything is done. You can't put in stuff that you're going to be doing, uh, even if you know you're going to be volunteering at a clinic uh, uh, or with a vet uh, into May and June. Um, you can't put that in. It has to be until the deadline of the background information form, so February 1st. Um, and then the other thing that you put in your background information form is the contact information for your three references, right? So your two vets and your uh, professional reference. So uh, we would need an email, and as soon as we get that, then they get an email saying, hey, someone's put you down as a reference for the program. This is the link to fill in the information um, and to submit your reference, right? So that means that if you submit your BIF before February 1st, your references have more time to do their job, right? You know how busy vets are. So if you can get everything in before then, like if you submit it in mid-January, that means that your referees have more time to do their, um, their job. Uh, if you submit for February 1st, then they only have a month until March 1st, right? So if you can do it earlier, better. Um, you can start thinking about when you, what you want to put on it already, right? Um, and have all the numbers ready. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Let's see. Amy asks, if you're applying for a second time, can you resubmit your essay questions for the BIF? Or do they need to be changed for a new attempt? You know what? We don't know <laughs> that you do that. Uh, we don't compare. Uh, so um, you do have to copy and paste it, uh, so it can be the same one, but uh, uh, we don't keep, or we won't look back at anything that you've submitted before. We do keep track of, um, you know, any kind of course approvals you've done. That's uh, something you don't have to redo, but um, you have to ask your referees again for their references. If you're applying as a second, third, whatever time, um, and you want to use the same person as a referee, then you have to ask them, um, to do it again each year. Okay? Is that good, Amy? Elizabeth, can I pop in for just a quick second back yeah. to that question that Megan was asking about checking all the boxes? Sure. And just so, you, so they know, as we are reviewing, though, if we're finding, let's say, a prerequisite course that happened to be taken in an inappropriate semester, so a, an, un an unacceptable semester, we will reach back out for a substitute. So we're not going to just close off the application at that point. We will reach back out to um, applicants and ask for a substitute prerequisite to be presented. And um, if uh, one of their last two full-time semesters isn't um, usable, you don't ask them, you just go back to the... No, we just, that's right, we just work our way back. So we start with the most recent ones, and then we just keep on going until we find two full-time semesters that are acceptable. Awesome. Okay, uh, for the application, do we give a rough estimate of the experiences, and do we need a signature for those hours? Um, well, I like I've been saying, um, Rika, I do hope that people are um, logging what uh, hours they have. And yes, if you don't know exactly how many hours, then you put in an, a close estimate. Uh, we ask for a validator for each experience. We don't ask someone to sign off on it. Um, we expect you to be honest on your application and tell us what you've done. Um, okay. Uh, Davina asks, can the referee be licensed in Mexico or another place other than Canada, or do they have to be have to be licensed Canadian vets? Okay, you may remember that I didn't say anything about a licensed veterinarian as a referee assessment. So the answer is no, because if you decide to work alongside someone 
who is an industry or government or research, they may, may not be licensed to work as a veterinarian in Canada. Uh, licensure is really um, just for clinical uh, work, and it means uh, that you're licensed to work with patients and clients. So they don't have to be licensed. They have to have a veterinary degree, and it doesn't have to be from Canada. But because you're coming to, into a Canadian program, we do hope that you work alongside people who have been educated in uh, North America uh, or work in North America and are licensed in North America because that's what, that's what you're going to be learning once you're here, right? So um, you'll gain a deeper understanding of what a veterinarian does in North America if you work with someone who's been through that. That's why we suggest you do that, okay? Hey, uh, this is Davina here. Hi. I just wanted to clarify. So I do have one vet that I'm working with from Canada, and the other one is a vet tech that works here in Canada, but she was, uh, like, she got her degree in Mexico. So would it be good to use both of those, or or would you suggest finding another vet from Canada as the second yeah, one? I think it's, you can use her, but she would have to um, make it clear in the letter that she is a veterinarian from Mexico. Okay. So. That's fine. I mean, we even allow people to use international experience, right? Like the, the, the vet experiences where you go to Brazil and stuff like that. Um, and you do work with a vet, but it's a vet that's probably or possibly not from North America. So that's fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Yael, Yael sorry, asked about what scholarships are available for international students at OVC. So um, if you go to the University of Guelph website and type in um, DVM scholarships, you'll get the list of scholarships. Not all of them are just for Canadians. Um, some of the, uh, the ones that are financial need usually um, are more uh, for Canadians. Uh, there's a few that are called access awards. Uh, that are just for Canadians that are Ontario residents, but anyone that doesn't explicitly say that it's just for uh, a Canadian or domestic student, you can apply for as a, as a vet student here. And in fact, uh, many of our international students do get them. Um, let's see, so, uh, Sophia asks, could you give some examples of good extracurriculars to put down? I don't know that there's anything like good versus bad. Uh, I think it's good if you do things that you work along with people, right? So it's fine if you end up doing something like for uh, raising funds for cancer research or, um, you know, volunteering with the Future Vets Club. It doesn't even have to be animal related. Um, it's just something where you work with other people. Uh, you could be a tutor um, f at the university. Um, and help other students. You could be, um, you know, a volunteer note taker for student uh, accessibility services at your university. Um, so there's lots of different things you can do. Um, and we don't ask you to do a ton of hours. I mean, it could be like a, a few hours on the weekend, uh, helping out at a shelter. Um, and uh, it could be like, again, like with the shelter experience, um, there's the animal experience and the non-animal experience. So um, those are good things. Uh, there's, uh, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of uh, volunteer experiences that you can do, um, some of them virtually. So, uh, yep, yeah, just try your hand and see what you like. Okay, hold on a second. I think I just went down too far. Um, okay, we got that. All right. Yeah, so I've talked about including high school. Yeah, so Ethan, um, I did say that there's a difference between extracurricular and animal related, and you don't have to have extracurriculars that are animal related at all. Um, you know, you can do pretty much anything. Yeah, so Priya, again, you can submit a prerequisite from any semester, regardless. If, you, if it has the highest mark and it fits the category and it's in an acceptable semester, go for it. All right, Sarah asks, would horseback riding lessons be considered animal experience or an extracurricular activity? Uh, would you be able to separate the time into lessons being an activity and a horse care as animal experience? So, interesting. 
Um, I would say that it's not extracurricular because it's something where you're like getting taught. So it's not really you performing like a, a volunteer experience, but yes, animal experience. I would say you can put that in animal experience um, because you're learning how to handle horses, right? That good? Does that help, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Okay, Marina uh, asks if for the three referee references or referees, can all the three be veterinarians? Absolutely, it's up to you, but two minimum. All right. Okay, Veronica asks, my friend is an international student attending Guelph. I'm assuming he will would still be applying as an international student. Would he be able to use the grades of the fall semester during which he is applying then third year, or would he have to wait until fourth year to apply to use those grades? Yeah, it makes total sense to me. So, Veronica, um, I, this, this, session is really not about international students, but I'll just explain quickly that international students um, versus domestic is only about your citizenship and not where you live or grew up. So if you're a Canadian citizen or permanent resident or dual citizen, you're domestic. If you are not a Canadian, then you are international and you don't apply with the same deadlines. You apply through a system that's run through the states that's called VIMCAS. VMCAS, and the deadline for that is usually around September 15th. It opens, this year it opened really early in January, but it usually opens in June and runs throughout the whole summer, and then um, the deadline is September 15th for everything. So that means that the last semester that your friends can have a course in that they could use is summer, not fall. So let's say he was applying for um, entry to 21, so next fall, he would have already had to apply because the deadline's done. Vimcast closed. So um, the only thing that he can do now if he didn't apply for uh, next year already is he could uh, apply for next year when Vimcast opens next year. Okay? And you can put him in touch with me. I can explain that better to him. Okay. All right. Ainsley. Yeah, everyone's struggling to find vet clinics that take volunteers right now. So a resource for you to find uh, um, veterinarians in Ontario is the CVO website. So CVO is the College of Veterinarians of Ontario. They are the licensing body for veterinarians in Ontario and they have a website that lists all the licensed veteran veterinarians everywhere and you can do a search by area geographic you can do a search by specialty so um, uh, that's a good resource just to find veterinarians um, and the website is www.cvo.org so org And so I don't think that really helps very much. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's very difficult um, in terms of virtual world to gain that kind of experience. The only thing I can offer you is um, the thought that uh, last summer, so the summer that just passed, uh, a lot of veterinarians in our faculty hired summer students to do online projects. So um, it's possible that, uh, you know, next summer, if there's still the restrictions around uh, COVID and volunteering, that that might happen again. But really, this is a struggle that everyone's happening, as everyone's having right now. Um, and the admissions committee will, you know, do their best to uh, un be understanding and compassionate about that. Don't know that that helps very much, but yeah. Okay, Nathan, are uh, veterinary references allowed to be from out of school? North America, yes. Um, no, we're not really seeing interview scores this year. Allison asks, if you're lacking experience in a certain section of the BIF, is it best to have lots of hours in a couple of different experiences you did? 
or have many different experiences with less hours each. Again, Allison, it's always about quality, right? Uh, so we don't want you to spend one hour at this clinic and one hour at that clinic. That's pretty obvious. Um, but again, um, you know, uh, we do like that you spread yourself around a little bit. But if you have like hundreds of hours in one clinic that's fantastic uh same thing with the other things you don't need a ton of hours um but you don't need a bunch of different places either we just want to see that you've made the effort to get the experience um and that you've um kind of given those skills that we're looking for so like veterinary experience obviously is all about learning what veterinarians do and learning if the career fits well for you or you know that part of the career fits well for you um animal experience is about learning how um uh, to handle animals because you're going to have to do that uh, in the program and also uh you know getting a comfort level with animals as well as uh you know it's it's good to know um you know, the different diseases that dogs get versus cats, versus horses, cows, that kind of stuff. It's good knowledge to have, but you'll learn that once you're here anyway. Okay. Ah, great question, Manchin. Um, will having allergies to being in a barn put me at a disadvantage during the application process? That is a great question because we've had at least one person that I know of, if not two, in fact, I think there's a current student now that has allergies to like hay and stuff and uh, uh, environmental allergies. We've had people in the program that have allergies to animals, believe it or not. Um, so it is doable. However, it means that you need to have in shots. So uh, at least f from my experience with the people that have had that situation, um, especially uh, if uh, there are times where you're working in the barn quite often, you will need allergy shots. Um, um, you'll need to be followed by your doctor or the doctors here at the university or whatever university you're at. Um, well, if you're here, you're here. So, um, yeah, it's really important that you uh, seek medical assistance for that. But it's doable. Um, and, um, you know, obviously, if you have issues, we'll try to support you in the program as much as possible uh, by um, reducing hours e exposure if we can. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely doable. Um, and uh, we'll work with you. Is that helpful? Hi, yes. Okay, awesome. Oh, good question, Nathan. So, um, when Nathan asked the question, are University of Guelph students given preference for the program compared to non-Guelph students? So, uh, Nathan, if you remember, I did put up a slide of our admissions process, right? Um, and nowhere did it say, refer to where they went to university, um, to give preference so uh, the answer is no um, but the reality is a lot of people come to the University of Guelph because they want to be a veterinarian so they do their undergrad here um, partly because they want to be uh, at the same university where they want to end up and partly because the University of Guelph has a, a, a spectrum of really amazing undergrad majors that focus on animals which is very attractive to a pre-vet student right so the reality is, is that uh, uh, the majority of our students in the classes do come from the University of Guelph. But it's not, I mean, it's about between, I mean, I would say maybe 60% of the class is from U of G um, or less. Uh, but it's all about the applicant pool. So 60%, for instance, of the class might be from U of G, but 60% of the applicants were from U of G. So it's not that they're favored, and it's not that they have uh, a better chance of getting in. Um, it's just that they reflect the applicant pool, so um, the more are applying and more are getting in. Okay? So Margaret asks, can I put visits to farms when I interacted with the animals as my animal experience? Absolutely. Can pet sitting other people's animals be used as animal experience? That's kind of near close. Like, that's kind of like ownership. Um, if, for instance, the animal had a medical condition and you had to administer, administer medication, it might be a bit more challenging. But 
I would say pet sitting is not necessarily the kind of animal experience we're looking for um, because you're just, well, I would say it's kind of close to, to, to ownership and um, I don't think that would be that impressive to the admissions committee. Okay. All right, if you did volunteering involving animals, can that go in either extracurricular experiences or animal experience? Okay, like I said, Allison, uh, best thing to do is to log your hours, and the hours that you spent with the animals would go under animal experience, and the hours where you worked, like let's say you were working reception, um, that would be in extracurricular. Um, oh, good question, Margaret. Would sports be considered extracurricular? Absolutely. Uh, if you use SAS note taking as an extracurricular on your BIF, how would you figure out how many hours you to put down? Well, log your hours at how long it takes for you to do. Okay, uh, Megan, can a veterinarian who was our reference on our application last year be a veterinary reference for us again this year? Absolutely. Um, so Sophia asks if you're taking an undergrad in science, but it isn't animal science, or are you less qualified or less likely to get in? Uh, absolutely not, Sophia. Um, everyone starts off at the same level when they come into the DVM program. And in fact, we love diversity in our program. Uh, we have people that have done engineering. We have people that have done commerce uh, and economics. We have people who have changed careers and have been, we even had a fighter pilot at one point um, who, got, who went back just to get the prerequisites and um, did really well. So uh, as long as you have uh, the ability to do um, the eight prerequisites and perform well, it doesn't matter what program you're from, we have uh, Bachelor of Arts folks, we have Bachelor of Arts in Science, you know, lots of variety. So that is not a, that, uh, is not a problem. Ah, okay. So um, following up to the question about allergies in barns, uh, what advice would you give to get large animal experience when I can't be around large animals indoors for extended amounts of time? So that's a great question. Um, I would, let me think about that. I don't know if, does anyone have any advice for a mention? Um, I guess, uh, well, right now it's not that uh, big of a question because of COVID, but um, I would think that um, um, you could volunteer with horses provided they're not in the barn. Um, and with uh, other animals, if it's on the farm, but not in the barn, uh, which kind of restricts you a little bit because you wouldn't be able to um, um, do things like uh, milking, because that's usually in a barn. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say the best way for you to approach that would be to discuss that with um, either the farm owner or uh, the veterinarian. I think um, uh, most farm owners uh, are looking for volunteers right now. Uh, and because uh, it's, uh, you can do it in isolation, um, it's, it's possible for you to do it during COVID, I believe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone out there, if they know. Um, OK, does anyone have any advice for mention? Just chime in. No? I think Just one thing you can do, do is if you volunteer in a equestrian facility, you could do feeding. Mm -hmm. A lot of places are in paddock mm -hmm. so you could get experience that way, and it's mostly outdoors. Yeah, I think the issue is allergies to the indoors, like an allergy to like the hay and stuff. <clears throat> okay, sorry, uh, I can't. Yeah, go ahead. If it's not, uh, if it's not too often, you could uh, use um, reactant. Like my my little brother has allergies to cats, and if he does interact with cats, he does usually take reactant. If it's obviously not too often in the week, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, Nathan asks, does working at a pet store count as animal experience? 
Well, some of it would, right? If you're if you're uh, interacting with the animals, and again, animals means uh, vertebrates. Um, I believe everyone understands that. Uh, so, Nathan, if you're working with the animals, absolutely, that part of it would be animal experience, and then the interacting with customers, doing the cash, those kind of things would be uh, extra work, extracurricular stuff. Allison asks, what resources can we use or purchase to prepare for the MMI if given an interview? So I did have a slide about that. Um, so uh, some universities offer MMI training. The Future Vets Club usually, uh, if we do offer the MMI this year, the Future Vets Club will most likely offer a mock MMI session uh, virtually if uh, necessary. And um, there are lots of resources on online as well. So um, there's even a book, MMI for the Mind or something, something along those lines. Okay, um, Nathan asks, how much weight does the essay answers and application have compared to marks? Oh, I see. Okay, so um, it has a huge impact. So. Uh, Nathan, so the, the first step is academic, right? And then there's the assessment and screening. So if you uh, are missing um, good things in your application, uh, or if your essays are horribly written, uh, then you might uh, be identified by the admissions committee as um, pro like problematic. And uh, they'll review your uh, application and make sure that um, uh, they want to invite you for an interview. So you don't want anything in your uh, application, your background information form, uh, or your referee assessments to uh, be negative or, or possibly shine a negative light on your uh, application. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, uh, so it is very important. And then after that assessment, uh, the interview and the marks um, become most important. Okay, Rita asks, are we able to volunteer with the OVC for veterinary experience? Uh, no, we do not currently have a volunteer program. The only thing really that's there uh, was Full Watch, and I don't think it's running right now, um, but you'd have to ask them. I don't run that program. Um, and um, uh, there, the, there's still the possibility, if you're at the University of Guelph, uh, to work over the summer with one of our faculty. So uh, what I would suggest for that is if you're interested in potentially doing a summer project is um, uh, go to the OVC website, uh, ovc.uoguelph.ca and uh, go to the departments tab, click on a department and then go to the faculty profiles and see if any of the faculty are doing research that really interests you and then reach out to them, email them. Uh, I would say the best time might be November. Um, don't wait too long uh, and say, hey, um, I, I've uh, read up on your research and it really is fascinating. I'd love to uh, learn more about it. Is it, are you potentially going to hire students for the summer? Um, and uh, you can start that dialogue with them. And then um, uh, when they put in for funding for summer uh, jobs, which would they, they will do in December, uh, you all already have contacted them, and they'll, they'll be on your mind. They're, you'll be on their mind. Um, so that's a good uh, process. OK, hold on. So Nathan asks, does applying more than once give more priority to, to those who have applied Once uh, someone on their fourth application give them more weight, no. Every application is independent, so uh, we don't even know how many times you've applied. So each application process is blind. Um, everyone's treat treated equally. Um, we don't know what university you went to. We don't know how old you are. We don't know um, what kind of undergrad you did, what, how many times you've applied previously, if you've applied at all. Um, all those things are things that we do not know. We just look at like what I showed you. We just look at your marks and then your application um, and then uh, we work from there. So. Um, you're given the opportunity to apply four times, but each time is an independent and equal application. Okay, 
So, unbelievably, I think I'm at the end of the questions. Uh, is there anything else that anyone would like to ask before we close it off? We're exactly on time for having it end within uh, two hours. Yes, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that this is being recorded and uh, we're going to post it publicly on the OVC um, YouTube channel. So that will be easily searchable. I'll put a link for it uh, on our website. Um, Nicole, is there anything you'd like to add? No, uh, this is very nice to listen. I was happy to be part of this. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you for being here. No problem. Okay. Oh, Keely asked an interesting question. Would marrying an Ontarian uh, citizen allow you to be considered an Ontario citizen for the application? No, I don't think so, eh, Nicole? I think that's more around citizenship, right? Like if you're international and you marry a Canadian and end up uh, becoming Canadian, then you could apply as a Canadian. Um, but no, uh, residency is specific to you and where you've lived. Okay, excellent. Okay, guys, thank you very much for being here. Um, so again, if you have any questions after this, my email, um, I can type it in the chat, but it's pretty easy, is vetmed at uoguelph.ca. Okay, there it is in the chat. So I spell it right? U-E-L. Oh, I, I mixed the E and the U together. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, guys, so I'm going to stop the recording now, but I'll stay online and answer any other questions if there's any that comes up. Okay? Thanks, everyone.